mastered. How do young people master language, the most awesome of human achievements? Is language development, especially the intricacies of grammar, biologically programmed, as linguist Noam Chomsky maintained? Is it the result of parental teaching, as the behaviorists believed? Or does innate endowment combine with a rich linguistic and social environment to assist children in discovering the functions and regularities of language? Researchers continue to debate these issues. From the very beginning, babies are prepared to acquire language, and caring adults support their efforts. In the early weeks, babies can discriminate most speech sounds, and over the first year, they detect word and phrase units that are crucial for making sense of what they hear. Listen in on how adults speak to young language learners. They use child-directed speech, a form of language made up of short sentences with high-pitched, exaggerated intonation, clear pronunciation, and distinct pauses between speech segments. As babies attend to language, they start to communicate. Now pay attention to this video. Come on, you can do it. Look over here. If I taught this old class in child-directed speech, you'd want to murder me at the end, right? But yet, I want you to really be conscious of the different way that we speak to infants and toddlers. Why? How do we speak differently? Higher pitch. Higher pitch, absolutely. Why would we do that? What is a, what does a higher pitch show It catches us? their interest. Okay, all right. Right. Now, and remember, the baby is hearing things like this in the womb. But yet, that change in tone is significant because it's kind of showing me, okay, I'm talking to this, this person now. Have you ever um, been listening to somebody when, they're, when they answer a, a cell phone call and you can tell by the way they talk who they're talking to? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Does that happen? Yeah. Like the phone, and pay attention to this. The phone rings, somebody picks it up. And you think, and you'll say, and you hear that kind of um, very sweetness in their tone. Maybe they're talking to a child, or a sweetheart, or someone they care about. And sometimes you'll say, who are you talking to? Because <laughs> you're wondering, who's getting that kind of emotion on the other end, right? Who is that? Who is, who is that that you care about? I can always tell my husband's talking to his mom. I can always tell when my husband's talking to a friend. I can hear the difference, or when he's talking to one of the kids. I can hear the difference in the tone. And so a lot of times tone is very significant because it's an emotional understanding or an emotional connection to someone else. What else do we do besides that high pitch? What else do we do when we talk to kids? Our facial expressions. We have facial expressions that kind of match that emotional expression. What about the speed that we speak at? Slow. Why would we slow it down? So they catch every word? Right, so they catch every word. What do, what do we do? What else do we do um, with volume? Or do we sometimes have a little more volume? Like, have you ever spoken to an older person? How do you speak? Just like that. Right. I, very, I recently insulted my mother-in-law at Christmas because I talked to her like this. But it's because she couldn't hear me, and I was worried about that. I was very, I was trying to be conscious of it, but I was speaking a little too loudly and too slowly. <laughs> insulting to her and I had to apologize and say okay let me adjust my tone to kind of match your needs so it's important to understand that we use different tones and volumes to signify our emotional connection to children and to show them pay attention right here's something I'm going to show you and all of that facilitates and helps with language and makes it uh, makes language development happen more quickly with others yes. cooing yes. or vowel like noises yes. appear in the first few months by the middle of the first year, consonant sounds are added, and babbling appears. Yeah. As the first birthday approaches, infants start to use pre-verbal gestures, such as pointing and reaching, to communicate with and influence the behavior of others. Soon, first words appear. Where's that ball gonna go? Ball gonna go. Where's the ball go? Between 18 months and two years, as children rapidly acquire words, parents begin to talk to them more often, stimulating their language further. Where are the shoes? Are they up on the table somewhere? Mm -hmm. oh, there they are. 
Language comprehension, what children can understand, is consistently ahead of production, what children can say. As Zach plays tea party with his mother and Professor Burke, he shows he understands a great deal of language, although as yet he says only a few words. In fact, toddlers have different styles of acquiring language. Zach is reserved and cautious. He waits until he understands a great deal before trying to speak. Hey, mommy would like some tea? You give some to Mommy? Ben is an imitator, willing to try out words as soon as he hears them, even some that he cannot yet understand. Research shows that storybook reading and make-believe play foster early language learning. Notice the rich dialogue between these toddlers and their mothers. Where's the teddy bear? Let's explore the house with Sam the kitten. Where's the kitten? Hop up! peek a -boo. Hop up! Hop up! Where's the kitty? Yeah. What does the kitty say? Yeah. Ooh, this is an interesting book. Look, one, two, three. <laughs> One, two, count with me, slide the tab, and what can you see? Can you slide it? Push. Can you push the doggy? What number is that? One. One dog. And what about here? What are these? What are these? Cats. Cats. Two cats. And look at all these other animals. By the end of the preschool years, children have a vocabulary of about 10,000 words and have mastered a great many complex grammatical constructions. They are also skilled communicators, as shown by their interaction with peers, their ability to adjust speech to the age of their partner, and their use of polite techniques to get their way. Conversing with children is the best way to ensure that language development will get off to a good start. Opportunities to interact with adults, either at home or in preschool, are consistently related to early language progress. Because if you don't interact with the child and talk to the child, okay, they're not going to learn the language skills that they need to learn. Okay, so let's under nurture. Let's write down. Okay, so importance of environment, the interaction, right? What did the textbook? What did, I mean, what did the video? Give us some ways that we can spur language development. What they talk to us about? What they show us? What were the moms doing? Reading. 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 Yes, reading is huge. Okay. And in what way were they reading? What were they doing during the reading segments? Were they just one, two, three? Run with me. Here goes the kitty. What can you see? Well, how are they reading? Interactively. They were reading very good in an interactive way. So what does that mean? What did they do? They did what? That's what I'm doing to you right now. They did ask what? questions. They ask questions. Okay, that is, you know, and when you take the language and literacy class, that's one of the things that we're going to teach you about reading. That, that's one of the most important things you need to do. Pause. Ask questions. Ask the kids to make what? Predictions. What do you think is going to happen next? Why do you think that's going to happen next? Who is this person? You know, one of the most important things that we do with books is we talk about them afterwards. What happened to this character? 
What, what happened in this story? Do you think that that could happen to you? And we can use books to explore all kinds of different, different situations and see how children would respond. How would you feel if you were lost? What would you do in this situation? Okay? So all of that is going to really encourage literacy. Anything else that you think that will encourage literacy? We talked about in the environment, reading, anything else specifically? Actually conversing with them. Conversing, very good. Lots and lots of conversations. And when do conversations need to start? In the womb. Talking right away, making that emotional connection. You know, when we look at social and emotional development this morning, it's really <coughs> odd at how early babies are tuned in to how you feel. That they know pre-birth, right? We already talked about that when we were doing the prenatal chapter, about how we can measure their cortisol levels and what happens after a mother's had an argument or is upset? What happens to the baby's stress level? It rises to, to match the mom's stress level. So if babies in the womb can feel stress, then they're very attuned to our emotions. They understand when we have conversations how we're feeling, so that tunes them in. All right, so underneath, when we look at the genetics, what do you think is an indicator that genetically we might be... Um, we might be pre-programmed for language. What do you think? What would be a, a, a fact that would help support this idea that we're pre-programmed for language? When we're born, what do we know? Language-wise. What do we know? I think we make a sound, someone's going to sound. Okay, so at birth, we have limited language knowledge. We have some, right? But we have limited language knowledge. Now think about our brains. We talk about how our brains develop 90% in the first two years of life, right? Or the first year of life between the first and second year, 90% wired. So our brains are very, very immature compared to what they're going to be, right? So at what age are we able to hold a conversation? For most kids, at what age are you able to hold a conversation? Three. About two. Between two and three, we can hold conversation. We can ask questions. We can respond, we can label emotions, make predictions, deductions, all those kinds of things. We know usually about 10,000 words. That's average. 10,000 <coughs> words by two. Okay, we go from knowing zero words. We know, like you said, Donna, we can respond to emotion, but we don't know any words when we're born, right? But we go from that to, to, to be able to speak 10,000 words in two years. Is that amazing? Do other animals do that? No other creature does that. Think about how amazing that is. And have you ever had an experience with a child? Now, those of you who have a little child in your life right now will really know what I'm talking about, where that child says something and you think, how did you know that? <laughs> Where are the world? How did you get that? <laughs> and you really, you don't have any context. Now, kids that watch now, there's, this is one, I think, in, in one way, television can really benefit vocabulary because it can really expose kids to a lot of new words, for sure. Now, there's a lot of research that says, though, that if TV is, happens before the age of two, kids can start to lose words. And we talked a little bit about the video deficit last time when we met, where kids don't understand that what they're seeing on the screen really has meaning in real life. Remember, we talked about the ball being hidden. We show them the video, they can't understand that. But if you actually put a person in front of them, they can understand that. Um, but sometimes we have an experience with a child where they say something and we think, I have no idea how they know that. I remember with my daughter when she was about 18 months old, we are running, I was running down the road. And she goes, look, Mama, there's a soccer field. The kids like to play soccer there. We don't play soccer. We don't know anybody who plays soccer. You're not watching television. How in the world do you know about soccer? You're 18 months old. And it's just amazing. Or you'll have a child come up to you and tell you about the giraffe. You think, I haven't brought you to the zoo in a couple of months. How do you know about the giraffe? Where did you learn that from? You know, so it's amazing what they know. So um, Norm Chomsky, I'm going to put his name down because I want you guys are going to need to know him. He was part of your assignment on the toy project. The most famous linguistic scientist said that our behave, our understanding of language is genetic. We just know, we learn too much too fast for it to not be genetic. 
What's the best time to expose like, a child to language? A new language. Before two. Yeah, sorry. A foreign language. What's the best time? Before two. When they're first born? Yeah, before two. Right, absolutely. If you can get them exposed before two, it's a sensitive period for language. Um, they learn different kinds of sounds. The Chinese make a sound that to us we cannot hear. It's a chi sound. And if you listen to it, you would not, if I was able to pronounce the sound or say the sound, you would not be able to hear the difference between the sound. You've lost your capacity for that. But a child at seven months old, they call them a citizen of the world. Babies at seven months can hear the sound. And if you're watching their brain on an fMRI machine, you'll see different parts of the brain light up when you hear the different sounds being repeated. But by 12 months of age, they've lost that. They can't hear that. So think about what that means to the brain and how we develop. All right, time to move on to our next case study. Our next case study is going to lead us into, this is your assignment for Wednesday, and it's leading us into this last part of Chapter 7, which is about um, infants and toddlers and emotional development. So our case is called The Case of the Screaming Baby. And I wrote this because I think this is a pretty common experience at child care centers. So let's read about Yi. Yi is a 10-month-old infant. She's shy, very shy around new people, and sensitive to new stimulation. Okay, can you kind of picture Yi in your mind, maybe? She cries easily about any changes to her environment. So we might call her a fussy baby, right? Very sensitive. Her father rarely sees her as he's working out of state, and her mother is very affectionate but works full time. She has been watched since she was a few weeks old by her maternal grandmother. All right, so the grandma's been there, part of the family, very loving, always taking care of her. A few weeks ago, her grandmother died, leaving Yi's mom to find a child care center for her daughter. Dad's out of state, just the mom, so now really, the, the circle, remember Ron from Brenner's circles of influence and that immediate, right, that a mesosystem system has really been dramatically affected, right, because grandma's gone now. So she's gone from having two supports to having one. Yi screams uncontrollably every time she's left in childcare until she wears herself out. This leaves Amanda, her caregiver, exhausted and frustrated. So here's Amanda. Amanda's at the center. She gets Yi. Yi is hysterical, right? Um, during the busy days in the infant room, Amanda often puts Yi down commenting, you're so spoiled, you just need to get used to being here. Read your assigned section, and based on what you learn, explain what do you say to Amanda, and how do you help her understand and comfort Yi? So obviously Yi is in a state of crisis, and Amanda doesn't know exactly what to do or how important this period is for her, but we're going to take a little bit of time to explore that. All right, so here's what we're going to do. You can turn it off for a second.